I'd like to call to order the meeting of uh, town trustees Wednesday, January 20th, Zoom conference uh, work session. Uh, I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance, Allegiance to the flag, to the flag. The United the States, States of America, America. and to the Republic, the Republic which is the nation, nation, one nation, one nation uh, under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty, and justice, and justice for all. Okay, will the acting secretary please call the roll? President Eric Schultz. Present. Secretary Treasurer Horowitz is absent. Absent. Okay. Trustee Ed Warner. Here. Trustee Pell. Present. Trustee Welker. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, First item on the agenda is uh, discussions. We have a Travis Muller waterfowl hunting location application that Bill Pell is handling. Um, anything new on this? Uh, Jessica. Yes. Is Travis here today? I know he was invited to the meeting by Lisa via Zoom link. Yeah. Um, I don't see him. Any other people? See him on the meeting. Uh, there might be Mike Irving might be here to talk about that. I know um, yes, he submitted. Here. He did submit um, in writing some testimony. I'll I'll let that I was going to read <clears throat> the record. So I don't know if you guys would you like me to read it into the record first? Uh, if you want to, that would okay. be nice. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Michael Irving on Friday, January eighth at ten o'clock sent an email, which I also circulated to the board, but I, I'm just gonna read into the record. In support of Mr. Muller's application for a blind permit in what is referenced as the slow hole in West Neck, this particular area had the channel blind, now currently Fred Havemeyer's, and two blinds in the slow hole north were often hunted without any safety issues. Fred Havemeyer should not use his past service to the town trustees to his own benefit. Mr. Muller, being a young resident, should be given the opportunity to hunt West Neck. It is well within the safety zone of hunting. A favorable approval of his application is most appreciated. Respectfully, Michael Irving. And then he asked me to circulate it to the board, which I did. And that's Thanks, the Mike. only, um, that's Thanks, the Justin. only, you're welcome. That's the only um, other information that I've received from the public on this. Okay. In addition to those two other letters that I read into the record the last time. Is, does Mike want to speak? I think he's on. He is definitely I on. He's muted, though. Yeah. Does he want to come and speak? I'm just trying you to. You should be able to hear me now. Can you hear me? We can hear uh, you. Yes. Oh. Yes, Mike. <clears throat> well, I just wanted to uh, address to all of you. I mean, that's a uh, very special area to me that. that you know, I certainly hunted there since I was a wee kid and uh, leased that property for a number of years and leased it from the Connick Land Trust. Uh, so there were a number of blinds in there historically. Uh, and I think that that area, which is referred to as the Slough Hollow of the West Neck, uh, certainly can take a, a blind in there. I think it's two year benefits because in years past, people would sneak in there all the time and and shoot, and uh, they always ended up going over on, onto the uh, cow neck property, and that always became an issue. So if you have Travis in there, I think you're protecting that area, and it's well within the distance that is is needed to uh, to shoot. Huh. You know, I mean, I would I would keep them up to the northern end of the slough hole. There used to be two blinds there. I had uh, spoken to Ann earlier. There was one on the, uh, what it would be the southwest point of the Slough Hall, and then one up in the north end by that larger creek that comes into the Slough Hall. And so if you, if you put them up to the northern end, uh, it, that's a long stretch over to the uh, channel blind, and I think everybody would be safe. So that, that's my thoughts on it. I don't know where you're at. 
Well, when, when you had the uh, blind there, did you have other blinds in the area? I took one time I had uh, eight blinds in there. I had eight permits with uh, Lee Berglund. And we had okay. two blinds in the slough hole and the channel blind. So you, th you physically couldn't hunt both at the same time. Yes, So depending did. on the wind condition, you either hunted one or the other. No, right. we would often hunt all three at the same day. Not, you know, switching to them, but there would be people in the two blinds in the channel, and there would be people in the blinds in the slab hole. Mm -hmm. And we never had an incident. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, I think it's, it's pretty safe, and Travis is... He's certainly, uh, he's hunted a long time and uh, he's worked for Lewis Bacon and he knows uh, the safety issues and he knows what he's doing. So it's not like you have somebody in there that's gonna be blasting away. What about the other three blinds that uh, is controlled by Mr. Bacon's other uh, personnel that's further up into Scala Pond that don't seem to be hunted? I think they're mostly on uh, Lewis's side, aren't they? There's, there used to be actually one more. Lewis used to have a blind in the slough hole. Along, I did too. I had a permit for one in there. You know, and, and that area, even when I was hunting it, people would sneak in in boats and they would uh, get up on the marsh in there and, and shoot like crazy and it, I think it would be much better off to have an individual on a stationary blind. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Any other questions? Mm, I, I don't think so. Anyone have any questions for Mike? Thank you very much for your input. Certainly. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yep, I know that area well, so. It's a pretty area up there. Oh, beautiful area, you know, and, and, and you guys uh, should try to keep it as, as nice as you can because that, that's a pleasure for everybody from hunting to paddle boarding to you name it, so. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. One of my favorite areas in the town. Yeah. It's one of the last areas that don't have a lot of houses around it. And uh, it's, it's uh, a pleasure between Rosemary Elliston <clears throat> Park and, and Peconic Land Trust. Uh, they've done a great job in preserving it. For all of us. Yes, indeed. Bill, I have one question being that you're handling this application. Uh, did the Bay Constables ever uh, examine the distance between the two blinds and determine that they could be safely hunted if they were hunted at the same time? Uh, yes, they, Rich said he did the measurements on the computer and they said there's enough distance between both of them. There was an email that was sent today. Maybe yeah. Jess, if you could read that into the record, that would yeah. be great. Thank you, Anna. I was just pulling it up now. Sorry. It's okay. I don't think yeah, I got that email. You didn't? No. I'll send it to you right now. Thank you. My fingers work slow. Because that, that was my concern if Fred was to be hunting his yeah. blind and simultaneously the uh, the blind on the northern side was approved if there was going to be any issues with uh, the shot raining on one or the other of them. I don't know if Rich um, used the, the old load shot range or did he use the new shot range? I don't I have no idea. Ed. Well, can we make sure that it's the new shot range because it does yeah. carry further and it's important? Let me, I give my call right now. Give me a second. Well, we're not deciding. Hey, Jessica, did... All right, I... then I'll call him. I'll read this letter into the record. This is from Bay Con... okay. Senior Bay Constable Rich Frank. It was sent uh, today, January 20th at 2.40 p.m. Um, it says, good afternoon. We are currently in receipt of Michael Irving's email to the board in support of Travis Muller's application for a deaf line to be installed in the slough hole in West Neck. 
After speaking with Senior Bay Constable Tozzolo in regards to this application, all state and town laws are adhered to in regards to legal shooting distances, etc. As stated in a previous email to the board, there was a hunting location in this area for years without incident, as reiterated in Mr. Irving's email. The blind location is in fact further away than the previous blind that was there years ago. The applicant is an employee for CowNAC and does have unlimited access to this area, which is off of the polo field. Please advise on your determination since the final decision is solely a trustee decision. Thank you, Rich. So that pretty much answers my question that it, uh, logistically it would be okay for both blinds to be hunted. Yes, he said the same thing. Yes. Just asked him. He said he did the new, the new stuff. Okay. Uh, and the other concern that I had being that Travis is an employee of the estate, if he loses an employee or leaves and goes somewhere else, how is he going to access the blind? He's going to have to come by boat, right? Not trespass on the property? I don't think he can get on it, get to it. There's not much water. I don't know if you can still hear me, but to get inside there, you, you've got to go by boat. There's too many drains and that marsh is too soft over on That's side. all muck in there. It's yes. all muck in there. There's actually, on, off the point of that slough hole, there's an old World War II uh, trainer fighter that went down in there and Parts of it occasionally poke up from time to time. But that's how soft it is. Mm. Interesting. I, I've clammed and fished in there, so I'm pretty familiar with the area. That's why, why I'm asking, because we have granted permission for these blinds to be established. And when the blind owner uh, you know, loses his ability to access the uh, area, it becomes a problem. You know, uh, The last thing we want is, uh, someone to be go trespassing across Mr. Bacon's property. So I wanna make sure that we are going to entertain approving this new blind location that the hunter knows how he's gonna get there. One thing, one thing I'd like to add to that too is um, people do transfer these blinds sometimes. So we have to keep that in mind as well for the future. Well, you have to make it non-transferable unless it's an employee or Mr. Bacon applies for it. Yeah, so or if you can go by boat too, boat. Eric. You, yeah, but you I don't can know what. Go by boat. How are you going to get across the marsh there? All that muck. He's going to access over. He, he's going to access it over uh, Bacon's property. And that place. Yes. That's what do you, you only have uh, water in there for a couple of hours at the most. Yeah, but a, a John boat, a tin John boat, would only draw about maybe six or eight inches of water at the most. So you'd be able to hunt it up most of the tide. You so can refresh my memory on this. Why is this of the blind time you can get a boat up there. What? Why was this blind canceled in the first place? I believe it was closer to the channel and it would interfere with uh, Fred's blind on the other side. It would be too close. Am I correct to write that, Bill? I kind of think so. I kind of, it's, I don't really remember. It was when I first got on the board. Yeah, I think. Fred had two uh, channel blinds, one on the north side, which is the slough hole, and one on the south side, which is yeah. his uh, blind that he hunts now. Moving it way to the north, almost probably six or 800 feet would uh, you know, give you a lot more room to hunt. And it's my understanding that, and if Mike Irving is still on here, that you'd hunt uh, you know, the blinds on opposite wind directions. So realistically, you, you're not going to be hunting the, each blind on the same stormy day. Well, that's, that's probably true, but I, I think even if they hunted the same day, they're well within the safety zone. All right. I just want to, I was going to ask you that before, but thanks for that, Mike, because that, that was going to be my next question. Some of the older minutes I just wanted to mention say, um, that it's not a viable location and that it's too shallow to hunt. Just to put that on the record as well. That's why it was canceled in the first place? Yes. And 
who owned it at that time? You know, Michael. Michael, do you want to chime in on that? Do you know sure. that, that history? I think I historically, I think I was the last permit holder in the Slough Hall. <clears throat> and the reason that I lost the permit is that we had a very cold winter that winter and the blind got taken out on that Northeast storm and ended up down by the crow's nest and I couldn't get it back there. So they said, since I didn't hunt it, I was gonna lose the spot. From the uh, record mm -hmm. that I have, it looks uh, like- Clarify the record quickly here. Um, the trustees owned it, that was a permittee. So he would he would have been the Correct. last the trustees on the blind and has, have owned the blind. The uh, the older minutes it, it does look like um, Stephen Schuster it was the was the last permit T on this spot. It looks like it was temporarily issued to him, and then was canceled or deemed not viable shortly after he was permitted and then was given another spot from the wait list. And after this one was not viable anymore. I think we gotta be consistent here and find out exactly why it was deemed not viable and to, before we start adding things back on again. <clears throat> I get to the bottom of that. If it's in a different location, that's another thing. How many more feet is it away? North, uh, north or west. Or... Hey, Jessica, how long ago was that? It was 2013. September of 2013, the letter went out to Mr. Schuster. And it says, at the regularly scheduled meeting of the Southampton Town Trustees on September 16th, 2013, your permit WN1113 was discussed. It was determined by the board, the duck blind location you were issued is not a viable location. As you suggested prior to the September 16, 2013 meeting, we will be placing you number two on the current duck blind registry waiting list. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact our office. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you for that. Was any discussion prior to that meeting? Did you, did you, uh, search the minutes or do you need the time to do that uh, between the next couple of days? I have some minutes here. Um, I can read to you the section from the September 16th, 2013 meeting that I have, which yes. says, um, Mr. Schuster received a duck line from the waiting list in West Neck off Island Creek. Mr. Schuster claims the location is too shallow to hunt. Mr. Schuster owns property off Noyak Creek and would like a duck blind there. Bay Constable Mark Barocco spoke with Mr. Schuster and told him his recommendation for this location is no, and he could further discuss the location with the trustees, specifically trustee Havemeyer, as he is familiar with the, with the duck blind location. The trustees present agreed this should not have been issued as a duck blind location, but trustee Havemeyer should be consulted before a final decision is made. If this location is deemed inaccessible, Mr. Schuster can be placed second on the waiting list as there was another circumstance that placed someone first. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have actually. Are there okay. GP, excuse me, are there GPS coordinates on the two different locations? I have GPS coordinates for the application from Travis Muller, I think, but I don't think we, the trustees were doing GPS coordinates. We, we weren't doing them back then. Like two or no. three years ago. But, it's about, it's about, but, far, it's, it's about 600 feet north of the, uh, Mr. Schuster's last permitted blind. Well, let's see if we can get uh, James at uh, in the next day or two to put it on uh, plotted out where, where it was in, and, uh, graphically so we can look at this. Okay. Yeah, that would be best. It's a distance between the difference between the two different locations. So we can really make a informed decision on this. You know where the original location is. I could pull it up on the screen and we can look at it now. Okay. No, I don't know the exact location. Yeah, I don't either, so I don't, you know. Well, maybe we can, somebody who does know can guide you in there. 
Michael, Michael Irving see? would be able. Michael, Michael Irving would yeah. be able to do that. Can you see our screen, Michael? Sure, absolutely. Okay. The um, the original blind was, I believe, on that southwestern. Come down a little farther, right on the right on the channel. You got to come down farther, right? Right, right there. there. Yes. Yep. Yep. And then there was one there. And years ago, as I said, we had one all the way oh, yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, up yeah, in there. up, up in there by that wide creek. Yep. Now, is that where Travis Smaller wants to place this uh, current blind? Yeah. So okay. it's, it's it's considerably north, about five or six hundred feet at least, right? If not more. Well, James, you have. Uh, Remember the map that you showed us the, the the last meeting where all the blind locations were? Yeah, hang on. The Have farther you, the farther you go in there, the shallower it gets. Right. Yeah, but yeah. you can you can get a boat. I've clammed in there until uh, if it's a winter low tide, you can't run a boat. But most days, it's averages about eight or ten inches of water. So a small John boat can get in and out of there pretty easily. Yeah, any flat bottom boat you can get up there. If you get a, an unusual tide, you're going to be out of luck. But uh, okay, for the most so that's, part, all of, that's all the locations of blinds in that particular area. Well, it's pretty heavy in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And those three that are on the western shore of uh, Scala Pond don't seem to be used too much, huh? No, I think those originally were put in by Lewis just to protect that uh, shoreline. That's well, holding ground. That's not, OSHA. <laughs> That's not good. That's no. what problem we have in other places where people put up blinds to stop hunting. Right, but that's, you know, that's the well, permits they, that are there. They only have to legally hunt one time a year, according to Yeah, the I think that's All right. another issue, those blinds, but. Mm hmm there's four, there's four of them, not three of them. These four. The one down here is, I don't, I don't think that's there anymore. It, it was in there last spring, Billy. It was? This okay. one? Yeah. This one's What's there. the distance between the blinds along the channel to Scala Palm? Right in that vicinity. What, what is it? These are not exact locations. They are not GPS. I just want to let you guys know that. Okay. Where do you want? What do you want to measure? I don't know. I was just curious about what the distance is between if that uh, corresponds. No, I mean along the channel there, between the two, like right between those two, where you have the cursor. No. To the right, yeah. Between these two, yes. That's, the, that's quite a ways because that other blind, I believe, is down on what's referred to as the crow's nest, which is a little island there, you can see. And um, 845 feet from the east. Every bit of that, okay. yeah. What is the point between that point to the north and the proposed location? This one here? Yes. Yeah, seven hundred and eighty-six, mm -hmm. roughly, roughly. Mm -hmm. And what is it to the other one that's uh, up to the north, north of uh, that? This one. Next, next one to the north. This one. Next, yeah, that one. Eight hundred and sixty, roughly. Okay. Okay. All right, it gives us a better picture of what's going on. Wow, Tuck doesn't have much of a chance in there, does it? No. Now, just out of curiosity, that blind in right above your cursor right now, what blind is that? There's, there was never a blind in there because that was, Rosemary Elliston is pretty close to that. That was added a couple of years ago. Yeah. They, they moved it up. Okay. I think it's, I think it's up over I think it's over here. By the elbow, yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah. There used to be a uh, stake blind in there years ago. Right at the elbow. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot more in here than there used to be. 
Uh, so adding another one, you know. Well, there wow. actually, there aren't more blinds in there. It's just that there's more people who own them. Originally, that was all burgling in there. He had at least eight blinds in there. A lot more hunting pressure. Yes. A lot more people. Yep. Hey, James. Yeah. What's the distance between the one what just um, right there to the next one to the west? All right, this one? Yeah, by the closed nest to the next one. Um, no, will it go back to the closed nest? This. And the one Which west one? of the closed nest. Right this. here, that one. Yep. The one over here. Over here? Yeah, to the west. What's the next oh, one closest? Southwest, right? Yeah, yeah. Or the, across the way, is that across the way? Uh, looks like it's on the north point. side, Billy. Yeah, how, what's the distance on that? Well, the, this one's right here off this point. Yeah. 753. And what's I, don't the know, I, don't, I don't know where that, you know, that actual blind is. I think it's a boat spot, so I don't see it. You know when I'm out there, uh, okay. where it is on the on the map, 735 feet. Roughly. Okay, so so, what's the next, so next one over. Uh, I think that's on the point here. 853, roughly. So they're all between 750 and 850 Let's feet. See. Uh huh. So the poor duck don't have a chance. <laughs> Something maybe we should think about is getting these like really GPS one day instead of it just being. I agree with Jessica. An approximate location. If we could get yeah. real GPS coordinates at some point, you know, if you guys were in favor of that. I'm definitely in favor of it. That way the yeah. blind will be exactly where it's supposed to be. Yeah. And if you have a duck boat, it'll be in the spot where you're supposed to be. Duck boats are very, difficult because sometimes they migrate a few hundred feet one side or the other of the location you're supposed to have the blind in. Yeah, I did do, um, I have GPS all the fish traps and spikes, but there is not as many fish traps and spikes as there are duck lines. So this would be um, a little cumbersome, but I think for safety purposes, well, I think on the application, if we just put the GPS coordinates and have the applicant fill it in. Mm -hmm. But then would the Bay Constable have to approve it? Like, how would that work? Well, existing if, spot? if it's an approved spot already, we're just uh, correlating the GPS coordinates to the spot that was given that person. Tidying up a little, yeah. Mm. I would be happy to uh, put GPS coordinates on the renewal application for next season, if you guys would like me to. I think it's important and mm -hmm. we have the capability, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might get a lot of phone calls about that, but I'm happy to um, assist people with that. Well, the bank well, could... go out there and inspect the blinds. I mean, they have, they have a GPS too, they can verify. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It looks a little tight in that area. How would you guys like to proceed with this? <clears throat> I think we should hold it over to the meeting so we can just talk about it, think about it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To which meeting? The next work session? We can discuss it at the next general meeting. Yeah. I think the controversy surrounding this uh, that has been 
disposed of and now wants to be reactivated, the parties involved and everything. It's a very complicated situation and uh, I think it merits further discussion. Okay, I'll place it on the, uh, the Monday, January 25th meeting for a discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, trustees. I appreciate you at least hearing me. Absolutely. Okay. Thank Thanks, you Mike. for your insight, Michael. Yep. Okay, Anytime. Thanks. Okay. So, Bill, you had uh, something else about uh, the Bronx Marina, but that's yep. going to be taken off today, right? Yeah, we did not. Yeah, we did not receive any information on that. Um, okay. From the neighbors. Sheila Comparetto called earlier and said that she had, I think, emailed either the board or Bill. And I just wanted to relay that message to you guys. Okay. Okay. And she did not want to come on. Um, she wanted to be removed from the agenda, I think. Because okay. she felt that her written testimony served the purpose. Okay. That's fine. Um, <coughs> I, don't, I don't have an email. She said that she either called and or emailed you. I'm not, I didn't speak with her personally, so I can't really say, but that was the message that was relayed to me. Okay. I will have to see if she can re email to me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next thing we have to discuss is the three year versus the one year uh, and four by four ramp permit. Uh, how are we going that with that with the applications? Is it uh, being is it successful? Uh, what's the public's feelings on it so far? Like an interim report. Well, I got the first one, Eric. So everything went very smoothly, and uh, I was happy. I was happy to get it. You, did you get a three year? You don't have to come back for three years. I got a three year, Bella. Yes, I did. I did too. Okay. So and I've been um, so far. Jessica said that we got eighty three three years and 112 one year. Um, I had a couple of people stop me, said they did um, it on online and they had their stickers in the following week. They were very happy. And okay. they I have heard not one complaint about the stickers at all. Great. Great. Yeah. Most so people are very happy. They get, the office is doing a very excellent job this year, getting them out very quickly. Thank you. Those are yeah, the numbers to date. Um, I do want to just let you guys know we're about two weeks behind at this point, just processing permits um, all day long, every day with the phones, people coming in. The mail in applications are about two weeks behind at this point. Um, okay. Permitting, I don't think is quite as far behind because we're able to do a lot of that from home, but I just wanted to let you guys know that we're trying as fast as we can to catch up. Um, the beginning of the year is a little bit, a little bit right. like right. that anyway. Um, I've heard m a lot of positive feedback um, from people in person, <clears throat> the Facebook page um, and the Instagram page. I posted about people being able to apply online for one year and three year permits. People were very happy about the three year permits. The one thing that people have been concerned about is how the village is issuing three year, how, or what are they doing? You know, are they issuing three-year permits? Are they not issuing three-year permits? That has, that's been a source of confusion for a lot of people. Oh, and okay. What we have been telling people in the office is to just hang on to your receipt for the next, you know, two, three years. And the village did say that they would honor that if people hung on to it. The problem is people are, you know, not great at keeping that kind of stuff. We tell them to keep it with their registration documents, but you know, things happen. So I just don't know how that's going to work. You know, next well, we have records, of, we have records of it in our office, so they can just come back to the office and you could uh, give them acknowledgement that they have uh, a three year permit to go next year or the year afterward for the village, right? Yeah, we can. It kind of defeats the purpose of the three year permit work -wise, right. workload wise in the office. Right. But, right. You know, absolutely. We can reprint the receipt for the people um and we should have a uh, we should have a discussion with the village maybe they want to do a three-year also take some I'll, pressure from them. i'll go down i'll go down there um on friday tomorrow i have to go up west but i'll stop there on friday and find out 
Yeah, oh, I'm uh, a, it's a simple thing. It's just an email that could be sent over. Oh, it's yeah. not something that's hard. Yeah. No. Yeah, but I mean, if they if they're uh, amenable to it, they can they can start issuing three years. They can use a template that we use, and uh, that'll take pressure off their office too. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Other but, than that, everything has been very positive. Um, just uh, do you want me to go in there, or do you want to send an email over there and ask them? Wh whichever you prefer. We can do both if you want. Okay. Because I have to get my stickers anyway. Okay. And I, by the way. I, I lost my receipt already. <laughs> oh, you did now, did you? Oh. All right. Yeah, I'm just send an email if that's what you'd like me to do. Right. Jess, yeah. how complicated would it be to, in addition or instead of um, issuing a paper receipt to do an email receipt upon purchase? Only because maybe it's easier for people to keep track of that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't think it's very complicated. It's just another step to remember. And mm -hmm. with the constant right. turnover here, it's just things that people might forget to right. do. Yeah. Okay. And just so then, you, then you have people like Eric Phillips who's not going to keep his email. No, I don't ah, keep <laughs> That's true. Um, hey, are you making yeah. fun? my uh, cell phone with a rotary dial on it. <laughs> um, yeah, we can, I mean, we can absolutely explore doing the printed and or email receipts. Um, if that's something that you guys want to do. Um, well, let's see how the village, uh, responds. let's see how the village responds. Maybe they'll want to issue the three year too and it's a moot yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. I'm also wondering if IT or GIS might be able to help us out with doing some kind of email receipt where we wouldn't have to save the receipt and export it and do all that stuff. I'm wondering if there's more of, you know, a generic way that they could just, it, once a permit's processed and issued, then it will automatically send a receipt to somebody rather than us have to do it. So that's something hey, that we can also hey, support. Hey, Jessica, yeah. the, the people could always take a picture of their yeah. bumper with a stick and walk in with a picture of their, their on their car. Yes, and we've also been telling people to take pictures of the receipt and the stickers on their car because in case they lose it. So that's something yeah. that we've been letting people know too. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gonna do because I save all my pictures. There you go. That works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's Thank you, Jeff. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Have a great day, everybody. Okay, yeah, you too. Okay, so Anne, SOMAS invoicing. What's the status of the buoys in Mecox? And you're on mute. Could we please let um, Tom Wilson on, Charles? And he has a presentation, so he'll want to um, share his screen. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean. Got him. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Tom. Welcome. Good afternoon, Tom. Let me, uh, hang on. Push the right buttons. So I'll join you, joining you from the research vessel Seawolf in Fort Jefferson Harbor, where I'm uh, uh, working on the you see in the background, but uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me uh, come in and give a presentation um, about where we are with the Mecox Bay Observatory. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, there's my email address. Please feel free to, uh, to uh, uh, email me and uh, ask any additional questions. And of course, there'll be time at the end for questions. So um, as I'm going to give you the official slogan of 2020 is the best laid schemes of mice and men often go awry, poet Robert Burns. And of course, about a year ago, we were all had very different plans. The uh, joke about the worst purchase I ever made was a 2020 planner. Uh, but, um, you know, we were preparing to deploy a whole bunch of observatory equipment into Mecox Bay. 
and then the uh, you know to to upgrade the capabilities we put in in 2019, and then March happened, and uh, my uh, the university got locked down. My uh, staff scattered to the winds. One was hiding in the Catskills. One was uh, tra trapped in his dormitory, and the third one was in uh, Vermont. Went up there for spring break with his girlfriend and didn't come back. Uh, so he was uh, working remotely from a ski lodge in Vermont. It sounded like the last scene of any James Bond movie, but anyway, he was there. So uh, myself, I, I uh, heard that the university was going to get locked down in literally hours and nobody was going to be allowed on campus. So my wife and I scrambled up to my lab and filled my, uh, filled my car with, uh, with uh, gadgets and in fact pieces of the, this observatory and went to my basement, uh, which is, after 30 years, is known to friends and family as the dungeon. Uh, and it's not a bad little electronics development uh, uh, facility. So I spent my quarantine uh, working on these observatory components. And in fact, we're able to do some electronic development I've been hoping to do for some time. And um, I think the results of that actually went into data loggers that are being used out in Mecox right now and uh, um, I think are better than the commercial grade loggers I had originally purchased to use out there. So, um, so we are operating right now out in Mecox. We have a weather station uh, at Scott Cameron Beach that has been operational the entire year. It was put in in 2019. We have uh, the uh, Flying Point Road Station. Uh, it had water level. Uh, that's the uh, tall, that's this tall uh, uh, tube, has a water level recorder in it, and that has been operational the full year. It was put in in 2019. And then over here is the salinity and water temperature station, which we uh, were able, we were eventually were able to come out and, and start operating again, be out in the field again. Uh, get my staff back again. So we uh, that's been operational since July 17th of 2020, and it is uh, operating now and broadcasting live to the web now. Then, get to the, then we put a second salinity and water temperature station in at Crescent Avenue. That's the south end of Crescent Avenue. It's been operational since uh, August 28th. And the mid-bay station, uh, the big uh, multiple water quality sensor station was deployed on August 12th, and it um, you can see over here. There's a little little icon that shows where it is, where where it's uh, it is, and it was operational from August 12th to December 10th. Uh, we pulled it in. We found uh, through. Uh, uh, unpleasant experience that if you try to keep these floating platforms out all winter, the ice destroys them. We lost a buoy in Great South Bay a few years ago, got dragged by the ice all the way from uh, from uh, West Sayville to Bellport and almost out the inlet, out the new inlet, um, and it took months to fix it. So uh, we've pulled the uh, mid-bay station on December 10th, and it will be put back out as soon as we're sure that we're not going to have any more ice for the year. And um, the thing which doesn't really, you can't really take a picture of it, but I think is almost the most important thing here is that we have completely rewritten uh, LI Shore, which hosts this system, has been around for over 20 years. And um, frankly, some of the software was getting a little old. Uh, it still worked, but it you know, was getting old. And so we've taken the opportunity to completely rewrite my, my uh, student, my programmer who was trapped in the dormitories. I set him to work and we've completely rewritten all of the back end acquisition, what they call the back end software, the acquisition software, the storage software, the server software. And uh, it's all new construction, as they say, future proofed, uh, written in current languages so that you don't have to be an old guy like me to, uh, to understand the language and, and work on it and, and improve it. And so all our active instruments right now are live on the web. You can bring your phone up and look, take a look at it. They're at lishore.org slash Mecox. And just to show you right here at the top of this is the top of the page, the weather stations underneath it, but here you go. Uh, location, latest observation time for salinity at Flying Point Road, Salinity at Crescent Avenue, 
locate uh, Flying Point Road temperature and Crescent Avenue temperature. And it not only gives the latest value, but it gives the average value over the last 24 hours. It gives the maximum value in the last 24 hours. It gives the minimum value of the last 24 hours. So here's some, uh, actually uh, in one slide, sorry about the graphs, but you know, it is science. This is, this is uh, uh, in one slide shows you how important it is to do these containment measurements. So what you're looking here is salinity from the shoreline stations in January. Um, the blue line is uh, Flying Point Road. The red line is Crescent Avenue. And you can see there's some breaks in the red line because we put it in the bay and then the bay went away. So we're, we're going to address that. But occasionally the sensor at Crescent Avenue comes out of the water. But you can see that here they are pretty close together, pretty close together. You can see a little blip of salinity here coming by. And then you see this huge spike in salinity at Flying Point Road, and it's not at Crescent Avenue. Um, what's happening here, uh, Mecox Bay, if you look at it, it's thousands of feet wide and it's six feet deep. So think of it as a dinner plate with a little bit of water in it. So when a blob of water comes in from the inlet, it moves around and it takes several days to mix through. So right here, you can see there's a blob of water. I think there were, uh, a trustee Welker said there were two, there were washovers last week. Well, here they yes. are. Here's the first high tide, washover from the first high tide, the second high tide, the third high tide. Each one introduced a blob of high salinity water into the bay. And you can see that over time, the salinity mixes, and if you look at it now, they're they're both pretty close. And if you go back to that, if you go look at the real time page, you see that the two of them are pretty close. But this is one one of the reasons why it's so important to do continuous observations at multiple, at least at, well, preferably at multiple locations, but to do continuous observations because if you came and took a single salinity sample here, you'd think things are fine, no problem. Look, uh, salinity is twenty four. If you, took, if you took a single point down here, you'd say, oh, we're in a lot of trouble because we're like 10 or 11. So having long-term observations allows us to really see a much better picture of what's going on in the bay. So I'm gonna kick through here and just show you a few, uh, a little bit of the data from the floating platform. This is from, as I said, August through December. So here's salinity, and you can see salinity goes up and down, nothing too exciting, but you know, it's still important data and you can compare it to the other two shoreline stations. Water temperature, no surprise there, it gets colder as the, uh, it gets colder as the uh, fall and winter comes on. But now comes some interesting things. Here's dissolved oxygen. This is percentage saturation dissolved oxygen. You can see that it goes, and this is surface, a surface reading, it goes from 160% saturation, which is a bright sunny day with the phytoplankton going wild, all, but down here, and that you'd expect, you know, in a beautiful kind of, you know, shallow, very well lit bay like Mecox. But down here, there are spots where you're getting down in 40 and 30% dissolved oxygen. Those are probably when, those are probably evening. But it shows that, again, if you take a single reading, you don't catch these little spikes. So that's something that once those, you know, once this all goes live on the web and when the platform goes back out, this data will be live on the web on day one. If you see something stress, something unusual, you can jump on it, send the bay constables out to take a water sample or to just go take a look and see what's going on. So this is turbidity. And again, you can see that they're, you know, it's sort of a reasonable low, but there are these spikes. These are like super high spikes. I wonder whether this might be associated with opening the inlet and a big, you know, big blob of, uh, of suspended sediment came in to the bay. This is, this is chlorophyll. So you see you have blooms, but this is the one that I thought was most interesting is this is phycoerythrin, which is a, uh, which is a, a, an indicator of blue green algae. And you can see here, there were two or three in August and September, there were two or three very high spikes in phycoerythrin. Now, once this data is live, uh, which it will be starting in March when the platform goes back out, if you see a spike like this, you can go out, take a water sample and bring it to Stony Brook, have Chris Gobler's lab take a look at it 
And again, you may be able to catch the possibility of a harmful algal bloom before it gets out of, but at least you'll know what's going on. You'll be able to, to look at them, to look for them. So our plans for the next three months are we're gonna to continue to take calibration samples to get good data. You really need to go out there and the Bay Constables have been very nice at taking us out to the platform and we go out to the shoreline stations and take samples regularly. And then we process those physical samples on, on our laboratory uh, equipment. And then we use them to make, to verify the data from, verify and occasionally we have to adjust the data from the continuous recording instruments because as they foul, they drift. So you can, you know, if you have sufficient ground truth samples, you can correct that drift and, and increase the accuracy of your data. And in fact, I am right now interviewing uh, students who are out at Southampton because it's an hour for me to go come out to Meekox from Stony Brook and I'll do that when necessary but for taking water samples and level checks and things like that, uh, uh, Southampton's only 10 minutes away. So in order to increase the uh, accuracy of the data that we're able to provide, we're gonna, I'm gonna have Southampton students coming out once a week to take, uh, to take samples. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna certify and post the final 2020 data in a public archive. Anyone can work with it. These, uh, these uh, uh, you know, this is nothing fancy. This is Microsoft Excel. So anybody can look at the data, anybody can import the data, and anybody can work with the data. You can, uh, who knows, maybe it'll be an uh, a, a science fair, uh, prize winning science fair uh, uh, project for, uh, for a student at Southampton High School. Mm -hmm. We're gonna re-standardize the sensors and prep the platform for deployment. That's mostly done. Uh, basically, we will redeploy the floating platform as soon as the danger of ice is passed. And here comes my first question. You think about when is that? Uh, I was shooting for March, early March, but uh, if, uh, you know, we could put the thing out in a couple of weeks. If, if uh, you know, whenever the, uh, whenever it looks like where the danger of ice is passed, we can put it out and get it running. And as I said, uh, we have all the software is all written now. So the floating platform sensors will report to the web and go up in the archive in real time on day one. And we're gonna move the Crescent Avenue sensor to deeper water. We have a, uh, we're constructing a, a stainless cage and we'll put it in a cage and put it maybe 30, 40 feet offshore with an armored cable running to shore. So we'll still get telemetry. Uh, and of course, we'll put up some signs, you know, don't, don't drag here, don't anchor here, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where we are, except I really want to thank, uh, it takes a team. Um, uh, my team members are Alex on the left here, uh, Miles on the right, and Mateo, who's still trapped in the dormitory, so I don't see him, uh, but uh, he has been a, a valuable member rewriting all that software. In fact, today I wish him luck because he has, he's graduating and he has an interview with Indeed.com as programmer, so hopefully he'll get a nice job. Coming out of uh, coming out of school, and of course, the town of Southampton personnel, uh, James Durier, the Bay Constables have been enormously helpful, and of course, uh, to you, <coughs> members of the trustees. So, with that, I will thank you. Here's some local residents checking me out, and uh, uh, glad to take any questions that you might have. Well, uh, not a question, but I think that uh, the data that you provide with the with these spikes just graphically shows how dynamic a situation it is down in Meekox and that we're going to have to really make decisions on the cuts on the fly. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's going to help us tremendously in the uh, Meekox management plan as we as we adjust it through the uh, course of the years and okay. all the patients going to be very helpful to uh, make decisions on not only you know the shellfish viability, but also uh, these harmful algal algal blooms. How it affects the the uh, the people who uh, whose houses are on Meekox Bay who are very much concerned about their animals if they go in the water, or, or even their own health if they go in the water. So this is uh, really good science. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I will say I did uh, write a, uh, a put in a public comment for your, uh, your permit with regards to the permit application to be able to have some flexibility in opening the cut. And I said exactly that 
uh, this new data that we're having is making a big difference. We're learning more and, and being able to see what kind of conditions uh, uh, produce an optimum result and also to be able to be much more mindful of, of when that is, uh, uh, you know, when a, when a cut needs to be made. And of course, that saves money. If you go out and you make a cut when you don't really need to, it takes time, it takes money, it takes personnel. And mm -hmm. then again, we're learning that, uh, uh, you know, opening the cut during certain tides. And we have a storm surge research group that can, can look at, uh, that can predict, uh, that can predict uh, uh, sea open ocean elevations uh, out a few days. So it can be one of these things where you can say, well, we have a, uh, uh, high spring tide uh, that is, uh, you know, it's getting to the point where we need to open the cut. We have a high spring tide uh, four days from now, so we'll open the cut three days from now, that kind of thing. So uh, anyway, very happy. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy with how this is going, and, and I certainly hope uh, that uh, I'm glad that you feel it's, it's uh, useful data and looking forward to uh, a really good year coming up. Tom, I have one. I do have one question. Uh, it's Ed Warner. Um, being a bayman and fishing and clamming in there for decades, I've always wondered when the salinity is eight or 10 and we get these washovers of fresh ocean water and how long it takes for that to transition from the south side of the bay to the north side of the bay. Because there are shellfish throughout the whole bay. There are oysters on the north side of Mecox, steamers, um, other types of clams, rib mussels. So I, I would really like to know how from that time it washes over when we get to spike at flying point or this, and then we get the mid, mid point of the bay with the float and then we get crescent. How long does it take for that water, that good clean ocean water to migrate to the northern part of the bay? Well, I'll go right, let me get right back to that particular slide. I mean, this is only one this is only one instance, but it still gives you some indication. Let me bring up this slide. This is, as I said, this is the last uh, couple of weeks at Flying Point and Crescent Avenue. And mm -hmm. you can see that, you know, here we had the salinities are down 13 or so, and then they dipped pretty low. There must have been a rain event or something like that. But then here's the washover. So this is a blob mm -hmm. of water going by Flying Point. And then here's a second tide. My guess is that's a second high tide. And then here's the third high tide or the blobs of water because they might've washed over. I haven't looked at the, at the, at the tidal record, uh, but the blobs of water washed over. And then sometime later, they make it past uh, Flying Point Road. But you can see that this is like the 15th, the sixth. So this is like the 16th and this is the 19th. So you can see that by the 18th or 19th or 20th, the two records are, are back together again. So that mm -hmm. yeah. indicate maybe it might take two or three days. But again, this is, this is great science fair stuff uh, or you know, master's thesis stuff because um, you can look at this. This is just one instance. We can look at, uh, for example, uh, uh, we can, we, we're taking weather data so we can look at how how, whether, uh, whether the wind, you know, if it's blowing like crazy, my presumption is that that helps to circulate the bay. If it's a flat, calm, kind of, a, you know, four or five real uh, flat August days where there's not much, where there's not much wind, you probably will see mixing take place on a much longer time scale. But this is all stuff that once you have the, once you have the data, you can do the science. That in fact, if you look up my TED talk, uh, my TEDx, SBU talk is exactly about this, where I say, you know, that that if you're taking the right data, you can do the science after something happens. But if you haven't taken the data, you'll never be able to do the science. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's important that we have it deployed now and that you've been getting all this data uh, pre and that we're going to have data pre and post uh, dredging project and see how that's going to, uh, you know, affect things. So in the future, uh, we can justify uh, dredging at, at, at when it's a certain trigger point. You well, know, just, dredged out. 
justify the larger dredging project, which right. we reach into the inner part of the bay. Right. That, that, that is really critical for a good, a good uh, insurgence and mixing of water on a longer term, like a week or two of transition ocean to bay, ocean to bay, ocean to bay. It's really right. important. So I'm, right. I'm very curious to see how that will work out once we do do that project. Yeah, I think you're going to have totally different graphs, but that's good. <clears throat> that's good. Did any of you have uh, to address your question, Mr. Wilson? Did anyone have any thoughts about when might be a safe time to redeploy the floating observatory? So Middle of March. Middle of March. We'll be yes. ready. If the, if the salinity is low in Mecox, it will freeze very easily. If the salinity is right. in the higher teens, low 20s, right. it has some salt. It won't freeze. But normally, the last hard freeze where it, it's a, like three quarters of an inch or half an inch of hard ice is usually around the middle of uh, March. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you guys can keep an eye out, have the Bay Constables keep an eye out. And, and of course, we've got the water temperature uh, we have the water temperature on the uh, readings on the um, uh, shoreline observatories, which everybody can keep right. an eye on. So we can watch, and when they get up to, you know, 10 centigrade, probably safe to, to go ahead and do it. Okay. That's another example of how dynamic it is down there. It depends on, you know, the, even your ice conditions. You can't even predict because of the, the amount of salt in the water. Right. Yes. Another, another question is, at this point, there are not dissolved oxygen sensors on either the Flying Point or the Crescent Avenue um, stations. There's only a dissolved um, oxygen <clears throat> sensor on the floating observatory. So one of the questions that um, we might want to look at is um, if we want um, to also install a dissolved oxygen sensor and what the cost of that would be so that we had dissolved oxygen sensors year round not just when the floating observatory is in well right. the best place to put a dissolved oxygen center sensor would be the northernmost site would be crescent avenue because that would have the poorest circulation and poorest water quality yeah. um, when you get close to the inlet you get the prevailing northwesterlies and southwesterlies this time of year and a lot of uh, mixing of the water. But when you get up in the back bays and further north where the more fresh water comes in from the groundwater, it's not as much mixing. So that would be probably yeah. the, the lowest dissolved oxygen and it would gradually transition across Mecox Bay. Well, mm -hmm. from, from a technical standpoint, uh, the observatories, the, the um, um, you know, the shoreline observatories are fully as capable because I used my little pandemic data logger boards, I put them everywhere. So they are just as capable as the Mid-Bay Observatory of supporting more sensors. So if you all are interested, I certainly could give you a price for adding oxygen sensors to the to the Mid-Bay uh, to the Mid-Bay Observatories. It's not a problem at all. I'm sorry, to the Shoreline Observatories. It's not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that weather station that you have down there, is that, uh, are you recording uh, rainfall? Uh, I believe it does. It's, uh, we, we bought a Davis uh, Vantage Pro and it records a lot of stuff. I believe it does have weather, it does have rainfall. It's got uh, UV. We can actually, uh, uh, once I make another pass through the webpage, we'll have the sunburn index in real time at, at uh, okay. Scott Cameron Beach. Because I think it would be good to, to figure out, uh, you know, correlate rainfall and, and how, how long it takes for the bay to rise, you know, that, a couple of days later. That, that might be, yeah, go ahead. That, sorry, that might be something we have to add, Tom, because I don't see that on the weather station right now. Yeah, I see wind not, speed, direction, air temp, and barometric pressure, yeah. but maybe in some place where I'm not looking. Um, it's probably just not reporting, but we can add it to the page. That's easy. Well, okay. one it, thing, and it is definitely, the sensor's definitely there. Yeah, because one thing that did happen back in the, I guess, 80s, we had 
like a 17 inch rainfall event here and the bay zeroed out. Wow. So it would be really interesting that when we have these uh, dramatic rainfall, four, six or eight inch, and we could document it and we could see the salinity drop because of it in the bay, that would give us a better talking point of opening the inlet after one of these extreme events. Right, right. Very good, very good information, Tom. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, you had had one more question, and maybe Jackie, if you want to um, weigh in on this, Tom. Your question was, how should the um, credit read for the funding, right, or something along those lines? Because it's actually these projects are actually funded through the Water Quality um, Improvement Fund. So Jackie, is there, maybe I can touch base with you to see um, what might be the best way to have it read on the site. Unless you're uh, weigh in there. Oh, I, yeah. mean, I, I mean, the only simple thing is to just make it as clear as possible to match the, um, you know, the cost estimates that were provided. Um, that's, it's just for record keeping purposes, but I can talk to Lisa and see if she would like anything specific. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. yeah, that is, yeah, the, 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 I don't know if you were talking about that or something else, but I do want to make sure that the trustees and any funds, you know, any, you know, I want to make sure that appropriate credit for the funding agencies is given on the page. So if somebody could get back to me with, with the wording that, you know, I want to make sure that people are appropriately recognized because it's, you know, if you, if you don't have the dime, you can't do, you know, <laughs> I don't have the time. <laughs> I can't, I can't take the time if you don't have the time. Yeah. And I think it's really for them, it's just record keeping to make mm -hmm. sure that they're paying out on the deliverables that have been done. So it's just really trying to streamline the voices as much as possible with the cost estimates that they're working off of based upon the contract. Right. So. Okay. Right. Feel free. We're, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can, if we need to reword the invoices or, or anything like that, please just, just contact me directly and, and we'll work that out. Okay. Because at this point, Tom, the only thing that has not been completed is because it's out of the water, but the operation maintenance of the floating observatory, because included in that pricing scheme is the um, real time for the floating observatory. So uh, that will be, so that would be the one thing maybe that we would take out of um, this invoice and then resubmit it when you redeploy the sensor or redeploy fine. the floating observatory in March. That would be fine. And of course there's, I tell people operations and maintenance, sometimes some months it's more operations and some months it's more maintenance, but that's fine. And, uh, and I understand, you know, that it's important to uh, make sure that we meet 100% of the deliverables. And, and in fact, you know, I want to meet 120% of the deliverables, but yeah, we will, uh, I can tell you that, that all the back end, the reason, the only reason that didn't get done uh, wasn't done while the platform was in the in the water was that we wanted to make sure that we had completely gone through and rewritten all the back end software. I didn't want to do, a, you know, I didn't want to use 10 year old 10 year old code and say, well, it'll do for now because we'll get to it because you never do. You know, there's always something else that you get back that you never quite make it back to. So we have the code is all written. Um, and the day that it goes back in the plat in the in the water, the uh, the web page will be live. At which point, you know, we can we can send the operations and maintenance for the floating platform, you know, back to its original deploy date. Since since you're going to have about thirty thousand data points uh, data records uh, stretching back to last August. But at this point, anyone that's interested can go right to longislandshore.org backslash Mecox Bay and pull up all this all the details and data that you showed on your screen. Yeah, lishore.org so. slash Mecox. And right. that's the real time page. And then uh, there will be as we certify data and put it up on the web. Uh, it'll be if you forgive the technical term where that's all available on anonymous FTP. And if you are a computer guy, you know what that means. And you just go, you just go click, we'll, we'll provide links. You click on the link, you click on the month you want, and then the 
text file with all the data downloads to your computer and you fire up Excel and import it and you can do your own graphs. Great. great. Which is great. Okay. Yeah. Jackie, did you have a question? Did you start to speak? No. Um, Sean, did you have any questions around this or concerns? I don't. Um, it's just a matter of um, the Board of Trustees did receive some invoices uh, for payment and the board is to determine whether the work is complete or not before they have to be paid. So that's a board determination. Um, if the board would like to render that decision, um, you know, either way, we know if these can be paid or not at this point. Do you have those invoices right there, Sean? Uh, I emailed them to the board um, at the okay. start of the meeting. I, I have them. Is that going to need a resolution on Monday? Uh, it was already approved. You were authorized to sign. Uh, President okay. So once the board has determined uh, there's an approval form that you can sign once the work's complete and then the comptroller's office uh, can get payment out on these uh, invoices. All right, well, let's take a poll of the board. Is everybody satisfied with uh, the results so far? Well, the only thing would be yeah. that- with the um, on... what you were talking about. With, Sorry? With the of what you were talking about. Okay. Right? Yes, there's one eighteen hundred and fifty amount, eighteen hundred and fifty dollar amount for the operations of the floating observatory, and that would be the one thing that, um, because it's not yet online, hasn't been um, completed. Because as part of the task description, um, it is uh, it, it includes that it will be real time. Okay, Sean. So how is that going to reflect in if we have a resolution that authorizes me to sign? something is that going to have to be modified then uh, yeah. and voted revoted on again it uh, once that work is complete you can sign the authorization form uh, if that's something that is very near completion um, otherwise we'll have to have a new invoice with that item off of it yeah, I, think I think it's best to do it that way in the in the interest of yeah. time we'll go ahead and reissue the invoice without that one item and then okay. we'll, uh, you know, we'll, as I said, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll invoice for that uh, the, you know, the month the platform goes back in the water. Perfect. Okay. Okay. I so, think so. Uh, so Sean, I, I agree. I think that's clear. Okay. So Sean, we won't happen to have another resolution before the board. We'll just receive another invoice with that uh, deleted right. from it. Uh, if you get that in tomorrow, uh, I can, I'll be in the office tomorrow. I can sign Within, that. Within uh, 30 days, we're obligated to make payment on that, so. Okay, we have time, good. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you so much for a really great presentation. Um, yep. We really appreciate it. Gave a lot of information um, that will be extremely useful to us going forward and it's really great to be able to click on lishore.org and see Meacocks up here with salinity and water temp and everything else. So it's fabulous. Thank you. Well, it's, yeah. it's a real honor to help, and and this is a uh, this is a great project. You know, I'm I've been uh, I'm very uh, happy with how it's working, and I'm very proud of how it's turned out. And I'm looking forward to many years of uh, really cool data. Thank yeah. you, Tom get some of the students to, uh, you know, process some of that data will help a lot in, you know, as part of their uh, projects that they have to do for their uh, education. You know, that'd be great. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom, well, for the info. Have a great afternoon, Tom, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, bye. All right, we have any other discussions right now before we move into general permits? You want to talk about um, clams? Right, okay. Uh, it's come to my attention through Bill and through other people calling me up that there might be some out of town shell fishermen that are in the bay that are using methods that are not approved by the trustees, i.e., uh, winches and drum heads within vessels, uh, basically uh, using the vessel to pull, pull the rakes and basically gathering more clams than what they normally would under uh, physical power. They've been here to for practicing for the past 300 and some odd years. 
Uh, we seem to have some people who are uh, not uh, following the rules and we have to discuss how we're going to enforce that. Any suggestions? It seems that uh, can, some can I are, Yeah, go ahead. Um, you're talking about tow raking and the use of haulers to pull the rakes up. I've done some research as far as the hauler. It's something that has been legalized in the state of New York um, as far as uh, retrieving the rake. As far as, far as power raking, I do not believe it's legal in the state of New York, but the trustees from time to time have allowed power raking in the Bay uh, for harvesting of clams. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, Western and Eastern uh, Shinnecock Bay and uh, Murch's Bay were, I, no, not Murch's Bay, Western and Eastern Shinnecock Bay, it was allowed uh, similar to churning uh, of the hard clams. Uh, we have done designated areas. Uh, so what I would like to see done is to have uh, somebody on the uh, trustees reach out to the Bayman's Association, poll the Bayman's Association as far as what their uh, thoughts and needs are, and then co re uh, come back to the trustees with a plan or a recommendation for us to look at uh, moving forward. This is the way it used to be done when I was on the Bayman's Association back in the 70s. Well, late 60s, early 70s and 80s, we would reach out to the Bayman's Association for their recommendations, being that they're the ones that harvest the uh, clams and it's their livelihood. Um, it's just a thought and that's the way it used to be done. Yeah, but why it, would you need winches and uh, drum heads, <laughs> hydraulic things now all of a sudden that you did that, that really weren't traditionally used out here? Hey, As Eric, I think they, installed on boats. Yeah, I think, I th Eric, I think they were, they were legalized and designed for deep water clamming where, where you're clamming right. 40 feet to feet of water. Right. Not, not in 10 feet of water. We really should not need them in the bay. I'm just well, I'm concerned just... that we're using, we're, that we're, we're going past traditional methods and basically dredging the bay, using power to, to, to take a lot more clams than normally would be able to be uh, physically harvested. And it seemed to work out pretty good in Raritan Bay where they were, where they had a, uh, they were allowed to pull the, pulled the rakes up with these uh, uh, winch, uh, drum heads, but Pause. that was uh, like four section poles they were using, you know, so I can, I can understand that, but physically they had a rake. I mean, if you, if you have a, out, uh, a, a boat there and you have the outboard idling and you're pulling back and you have a cable attached from the boat to the bottom of the rake, you're effectively mechanically dredging the bottom. And I just see that, um, that either you got to set some limits on things or or um or uh, outlaw it because the amount of money that's being put into the bay to put clams in now seems to be uh, you know the, the well, take is much more easier now with uh, with dredging methods you know? well i well then if you want to do it that way then just say that it's illegal to use a hauler it's illegal to use an engine I mean, it, right now it is illegal to use an engine, but as far as a hauler goes, and I've done some research in the town, uh, you know, uh, laws, I have not found anything that specifically references a hauler. Now the state has allowed it. So it's kind of a gray area, which has been created because of this new method of uh, retrieving a rake. Yeah, I, know. I think way back, um, the local pavement did not need haulers. Um, because of the shallow water and they, and they didn't even think about it. Um, I, and it's, you know, most of the Bateman I spoke to over the weekend who've been calling me and people I have spoken to in a few years called me and they're very concerned that the, it's going to, and it, it keeps on going another year, this stuff's going to be depleted. They're having a, a very good year. They said, um, they've been working very hard and I realize clamming's not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. but it, it puts it, you know, it has to be fair to, fair to all of them. If one person does it, they all should do it. Um, you can't have half the fleet say it's okay, and another half says it's not okay. 
Well, like Billy, I had discussed this previously with you that I had asked the Bayman's Association to have a meeting almost three years ago when this first came about to discuss it amongst the Bayman and then make a recommendation to our boards for us to review. I have not got that information yet. Maybe you'd like to reach out to them and see what their answer is. But, uh, but I have done some research as far as this hauler and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it does not spe specifically say anything in our blue book that precludes someone from using a hauler. So we could actually have a public hearing on it. Yes. This well, I mean, you maybe you should do some research and look at it. But if you oh. find something different than me, I, I will uh, gladly, you know, sit down with you and discuss it. But this is what I've learned looking into it over the last three years. Yeah, I understand that. Well, the other issue remains is that if you are have the engine idling and you have it, whether it's hooked to a hauler or it's hooked up to a cleat on the boat, you're still mechanically dredging the bottom. And, uh, you know, Chris Gobler was on the other day and said there's a tremendous clam harvest. And it's just curious as to why all of a sudden need, you know, mechanical means to, uh, to retrieve clams that has traditionally been used by, you know, physical power instead of now it's, uh, it's come to my attention that just some out of towners using, you know, having the outboards idling and, and, and pulling the boat backward. So uh, enforcement is very difficult because if anyone sees the Bay Cosmo coming down the bay, they're just going to shut the motor off. You know, so maybe the, uh, the option is to that if you are indeed clamming, then you have to have the motor up. That's the only way I could see that you could enforce it, that, you, that nobody's power raking because uh, you, know, you can't do it with the engine up. Just to clarify, when you're saying that they're out of towners, are these people that have moved here and have no, legally- No, the people from other towns coming in with the Bayman's Association has been complaining about why we have to have these stickers on the boats because we have such a good harvest coming in that uh, people are pulling all kinds of uh, scams, so to speak, to uh, you know take clams out of our waters. So we have to uh, you know look into that also. I don't know whether it's uh, our local guys. I should. I hope. I hope it's not. But uh, some of the other people seem to be from the reports that are coming in that people are using the boat to actively drag the rake down the bottom, down the uh, down the bay. And harvest clams, which allows you to take a lot more clams than you could if you were just raking. Is that something you could see if you flew a drone over them? Uh, yes, I was talking to one of the baymen. He was sitting at the end of the road, and he said, was, "As he was talking to me, he saw three boats out there." He said, "All three boats were power raking to the right of him. There was one boat way to the left, and he said that boat was not power raking." He said, "If you know what you're looking for, you can, you can find that, find out." And if you if you just the average eye cannot tell, unless it's flat calm. Yeah, I mean, if you have the, if you have the motor idling or very very running very low, it's not going to leave any wake. But the and, bay constables have a drone that they can use, so maybe that would be helpful. It has uh, quite yes. a range. Yes, and also a lot of these boats with the, they have two outboards. If you notice, a boat has a big outboard that has a little one right alongside of it. They use the little one because to power rate because the big one it's too much torque and it moves it too fast. So that's why I that's why if a guy has two outboards and he's going hard clamming, that's what he's using it for. Unless he breaks down, then he's coming home on the little one. Well, I'd like the input of the of the uh, Bayman's Association as to how they would enforce if there is uh, funny business going on with uh, power raking, everything. How they how what their suggestions on enforcement would be, what they would do if it was if they were in our position. Me, go ahead, Ed. Um, I got Willie Caldwell's contact number. Do you want me to call him and have him contact you, Eric? Sure, sure. Or All he right. could call. Or he could call into the next meeting too. Yeah, sure. All right. Sure. He's going. He's scheduled to, to talk next Monday about um, the harvester of steamers and meacocks. Oh. Okay. So we don't to catch him unaware. We'll fill him in on questions that we want to ask him. Yeah. Okay. You can you can, okay. you can tell him ahead of time, Ed. All right. I'll 
So oh. he's so All he's right. prepared. So he can poll some of his members. Yeah, because yeah. it's an odd it's an odd number, so that he's not working raising yeah. claiming that day. Nope. I will I will do that and I will ask him, you know, to be prepared to answer some questions. All right. Okay. Let's, Thank uh, you, Ed. Let's, let's start yep. the dialogue. You know? Yes. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, Bill, do you know what the status is of Tom's Palm these days there with the numbers on the uh, harvest? Uh, no, I haven't added the numbers up. Um, last time it was getting close, but I'll add them up in the next couple of days. Okay. We can talk about it on Monday then. Yeah, I'll get it by Monday. I'll have the numbers. Okay, great. Okay, any other discussions right now? No, okay. Uh, then we go into general permit applications for determination. So I have the first one. So James, if you want to bring that up, of Stuart Leichter of Seven Bayberry Lane in Remsenburg. This bulkhead has been redone several times in the last 30 years. Takes quite a beating down there. Okay, you got the project description up. Anybody here representing it? Uh, end consultants, are they on? Charles says end consultants on? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Who's representing the one second, end consultants? Different when you share, it's hard to bring them in. Okay. Rob is coming in now. Okay. Put your video on. There you go. Cool. You good? Hey, y'all. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. Hey, hey, Rob. So I'll, I'll try to be quick, Eric. It is, it's, okay. a pretty, it's a pretty straightforward application. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, there's uh, some pretty long permit history with yeah. the trustees on this site. Um, that little boat base and everything was created legally with trustee permits. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't think about putting in the application, uh, there's a fence, a chain link fence that runs down the side, both side property lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm guessing they're gonna probably wanna, I mean, obviously they're gonna have to take the ones that are there down. Um, was just wondering what your pleasure was in terms of uh, putting the fencing back uh, whether we could run it. There's a pool on the property. So the question was, you know, could we run it to the bulkhead and then put in a gate? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can see it right there. Not in great. There's, there's no well, gate there now, right, Rob? Correct. No, no, it's just a broken down fence. I mean, it's, it's on the, it's on the corner. Right. So it's, it's not really a, a natural place for pass and repass, but I right. just, I, you know, just being honest about it, I, I didn't think about it when I did the application. And then when I was looking at some of the pictures and talking to the owner before the work session, uh, it came up. And I think on the far opposite side, uh, there may be a similar fence that's actually the neighbor's fence. So they right. would have to, uh, you know, address that too. Rob. I didn't know if that was something you needed us to put in the application or well yeah it would be under one of the general permit conditions that either it, it either is uh, is either stepped back the fence or a uh, self-closing gate on that okay. path pass and what's what's the distance Eric for if it if they were just going to stop it before they got to the end is it like four feet oh, or something usually like, that? like four or five feet five feet somewhere five foot pass or repass yeah 
All right. So that if you can put that in as a condition, that's that's easy. Yeah. Um, and a real minor question: the contractor had spoken to me. You know, we show the little typical profile, which is not supposed to be an engineering drawing, but he was saying, uh, I think in our profile we show eight by eight whalers, and uh, yeah, if you go to sheet two, mm -hmm. uh, he was probably going to use six by six. That's fine. So. I didn't think that was something you necessarily needed us to to change, but he was thinking with all the green heart material that the eight by eight is probably going to be a little overkill. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rob. I don't think that we would really uh, worry <clears throat> about that, whether it's eight by eights or six by sixes. Yeah, it's not something you would typically put. It would be a, 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 something that you would uh, make a decision on in the field. Yeah. Yes, Is it? I have a question. Um, the rocks are on the neighbor's property. Yeah. Um, should there be a ladder at the end of that bulkhead? If you're thinking about repairs? A ladder for? Some way down here. If you're, gonna, you're thinking about repairs, how are the people going to repairs? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, if someone's in the water and want to get up, they can't climb over the rocks. They're going to have, you know, they're walking the shoreline. They're going to have to climb up. The Does it go head. dry there, Billy? For, I don't know. Traffic? It's, it's Only, not. And yeah. I know that the owner is an attorney. <laughs> so I know his response would be that he would not want to put out something that invites people to come up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying if you if you're gonna make for repairs, how are you gonna repairs if you have this you have no access? Well, that's that was my original comment to Eric. It's not really an area. I mean, this is an area that's underwater. So you know, we're not encouraging repass pass and yeah. repass, but in case someone breaks a boat down, they should be able to get along there in a boat and get it to a safe harbor. Yes. Yeah. So I mean I guess I, I would be reluctant to. I don't know about a ladder. I think, I mean, if you have the ability to crawl over the top of the rocks and work your way up onto the shoreline. Yeah. And walk along the, the, you know, the, the, uh, you have to provide some pass and repass along that return also. You know what I mean? Uh, I do. Yeah, yeah. So there, there it would have to be set in from the bulkhead. Yeah. Just set the right. fence from the bulkhead. Yep. Yep. That's that's agreeable. I don't. Okay. Is what it is. Well, if I you use, that, uh, I've been around too long. I think this is about the third time I've reviewed this particular property <laughs> in the course of twenty something years. <laughs> Eric, if you use the corrugated plastic uh, vinyl bulkhead, you can put a cap on the top of it for the ability for people to like a eighteen inch cap along the return, so you can actually walk along there and then walk through the you know, the, where the fence isn't. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's right on that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at my profile, if you just jump back to sheet two again, we, we do he show a cap. cap. We have two sections because on the, on the, yeah, inside, on the, the canal side, the there's a, there's a walk. Right. Yeah. yeah. On, the, on the canal side, there's a walk, but on the bay side, there's no walk, but we still going to have a cap, which we show in the drawing there. Right. I think it's on the previous drawing, right? Yeah, there's there. yeah, there's two there's two sections. So two that, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Lots of four foot. Yeah. So that's that's, that's the and that's the walkway that's on the canal side. Okay. See it? Yep. But on the bay side, we would still have a cap, so it'd still be walkable. Yeah. No, I I did that down on my shore, and it worked out to be very nice. You don't have yeah. to worry about people falling in and hurting themselves. Yep. Yeah, I propose a cap on all of these corrugated jobs now. And if you use the uh, through flow decking, it won't blow up with the wave action. When the wave hits the corrugated uh, vinyl, it shoots up and breaks most of the uh, capping off. If you use the uh, light penetrating or flew throw through flow decking, it won't have any resistance and it'll stay there during storms. What I've been seeing some of the contractors using now more often on some of the North Fork projects, even on the sound, is these uh, metal caps. 
Yes. They're basically full, full grids. And yep. uh, that's what they've been using so that you don't get that, you know, push. Yep. Uh, that would work. Yep. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to move this forward. I'm okay with it. Okay. I'm fine with it. Okay. Thank you, Rob. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks, Rob. The next one is Wendy Barron, 190 Dune Road, and uh, Gina is representing this DKR Shores, so uh, I think she said she was going to be here. Charles, is she? Uh... She's here. Okay, great. Okay, Gina, if you're there. Hi, I'm here. Okay. All right, hold on. I'll call you guys back. Okay. Hi, I'm here. I'm here for okay. So you want to describe um, the project? Earlier. Um, James, are you there? Yeah. Did you get the stuff I dropped off to you? Uh, when did you drop it off? Oh, goodness. Last week, right after the last meeting. Um, what, did, what did you drop off? Extra check for $500. Um, and I changed the application from new to uh, legalized. And I retyped the cover page. Okay. So um, amended application. Uh, if you click on it, maybe it'll, it's been it's, scanned. This is the older one. So I don't that's, know if it's- Now been, that's the older one. Right. Uh, I don't know if it's been uh, updated in here yet, so. If everybody recalls this one, we were talking about this at the last meeting where the uh, neighbor had, uh, there was a dispute with the neighbor and they wanted to build the platform over, over and with the stairs so they could get to the, remember that one? It's down in yes. uh, West Beach. Yeah, okay. yeah it was a, a small like two uh, by two foot time by like 10 sort of elevation that mm -hmm. goes over the existing stairs. It was for a handicapped person. Yeah, right? it was for him to get right. safely on and off the boat at high yep. tides because it was impossible for a human even get on and off so right. and there was a couple of accidents but mainly it's because he's, he has balance problems and he's older and handicapped so mm -hmm. okay um the lighting that's your that you're recommending is it uh dark skies compliant um i i believe so it's solar lights they're only solar caps on top of the pilings okay. actually because oh. we have because we have had issue with people putting uh lights on their docks and on their right. waterfront and the neighbors, uh, you know, not being very happy. They were lighting their neighbor's house up. So I just want to make sure the light is confined to their property and not their neighbors also. Okay. I'll talk to um, the um, electrical department about designing something that's dark skies compliant. So maybe Excellent. one of those lights that just go along the walkway. That would be good. You know, yeah. those little tiny okay. like rope lights um, instead of, you know, the uh, ones that they had. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk to them about that. The electrician. Okay. So, um, Jean is saying that she supplied all the information that we wanted. She's going to yeah. look into that with the, uh, dark guys compliant. And I'd like to move this, uh, on, uh, she said it's all in the office. Uh, James will check and, yeah. uh, put this on for the next, uh, next meeting when it comes up for a report. Okay. James, so you, you could check tomorrow. Um, make sure you have it. You're okay. comfortable with that, James? Yeah. Yep. As long okay. as it, you know, she changed it to what you guys wanted. Yeah, I can always rescan it and rescan the check because I, of course, make photocopies of everything. So. I'm, I'm sure it's just in the mail. Okay. I'm sure it was okay. getting logged in soon. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank if you. If we can't find it, then I'll let you know. Okay. Right. Okay. Very and good. I'll rescan it to you. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, awesome. Regina. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Be safe. You too. Good. Bye. Okay. Okay. So the next item is uh, 59 Romana Drive, Hampton Bays. That Scott was handling it. Uh, you want to bring that up? Is anybody representing that uh, application? Uh, into science, maybe. Uh, no, it says owner. It says owner. Okay. Suzanne Herman. 
do you want to go over it? I mean, I'm familiar yeah, with it. Go over it. Yeah, well, we're all yeah, pretty much familiar with it. Uh, uh, let's see the... Uh, the um, yeah, it's, it's being really slow right now, so... <laughs> Just give it a minute floating right it's now. basically that mouth and that uh that block of sand that's right at the end of the canal that's usually the problem there mm -hmm. i've been working with every department in the town to get a deposition site but no one wants to allow the material to be placed it on that property and also next door the uh association uh, beach club okay. aren't in favor of it either so it's too bad. It's pretty good sand. Make make uh, things a lot easier. I know. Uh, they had changed uh, from what uh, James was saying that they originally had wanted a thousand yards, and they've changed now to five hundred. Uh, that's Four, true. Four hundred. Four hundred. Have you gotten a uh, uh, letter to that? So uh, I I did receive a. They they sent in the application for the DEC short environmental assessment form. That's what they changed. So I'm I'm still waiting on the actual uh, hour cover sheet. But yeah, they fully intend on doing it instead of 400, uh, 1,000. So um, mm -hmm. that's it. Are they going to use a barge and put it on a barge and truck it out of there? Apparently so. Um, they said they're going to remove it to another site. So I don't. They don't have any. There's, there's no other way of of getting it out of there. Uh, it's all completely uh, uh, built built up around that uh, that point there. Uh, I believe it had to do something with the uh, uh, fixing the uh, maintaining the brush jetty also. Okay. A good place for that material would be over at Road H on the east side, where the uh, between us and the county property, where we have the uh, dead men and lay logs there. That needs a, mm -hmm. a few hundred yards of clean sand. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Or the end of Far Pond Road. Yes, there's there's no sand there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're moving it by barge anyway. Yeah, but they can't well, get a they barge, move it by close. barge to a uh, to a dock, and then they offload it onto trucks. And they put it in a uh, they put a barge with a dumpster on the back of it. They load the dumpster, bring it probably around to. Uh, Probably around the East Quag, I guess. Bay Avenue, yeah, that's the only place you can get to. That's there. where they offload, and they'll uh, bring another crane over there and offload that dumpster onto a uh, into a uh, dump truck. Hmm. So. Well, this project's been in the works for you know uh, ne needed to be done for at least four years, so I'm in right. favor of mo moving yep. it forward I'm once we get all the material, all the information. Right, James? Yep. Yeah, it's been going on for 20 years. So same thing, same. Yeah. Same thing. So, all right. So, uh, you know, I'd like to move this forward. Okay. Everybody else. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. So uh, Ed's next with uh, Deborah Kalen. Is Rob still here? Um, I don't know. Well, I, I got a hold this because I haven't, I have oh. not had a chance to look at the material, uh, the information that uh, Rob has brought to the, or Susanna has brought to the office and sat down with James on it yet. So, Susanna's okay. here. Susanna's here, Ed, if you want okay, to. Let, let her talk, yes. Okay. Can you let her in, Jane? Uh, yes, yes. Charles, uh, thank you. This is her document that she uh, submitted. So basically I provided the overlay that you guys requested at the last work session. Um, just to refresh your memory, there was a, a platform right on the landward side of the bulkhead um, within Shinnecock Beach Road. Um, it was replaced uh, more recently, and we're trying to uh, legalize that replacement. Um, so I overlaid, there it is, there's my overlay. Um, what was pre-existing and what was um, previously approved, I gave you a copy of the permit from 2008. Um, and what was previously approved was 13 feet by 21 feet, six inches. 
and what was recently reconstructed was 13 feet by 24 feet. Um, so it is slightly larger than what was previously approved um, by two and a half feet um, parallel to uh, Shinnecock Beach Road. Um, also, the, the western side is in the same spot, which is about two feet over the joint property line with the neighbor. Yeah, but when I, I was at, now, now I can see it very clearly. So mm -hmm. the joint property line, the applicant's property is somewhat landward of this deck, which is solely on our trustee Shinnecock Beach Road, correct? Both, both uh, the neighbor's property and this property right. have this structure. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a legal question for <laughs> Sean. Is it something that we can approve being that it's, uh, I guess, seaward of the adjoining property, but on our property? Hmm. You've approved this in the past. I know, but I'm looking at it with, diff with what some of the uh, people that have submitted stuff in the last years since I, we reviewed this initially, has we've made them move it off of their neighbor's property or or I guess there's no, uh, how would I say, extended property line for a deck yep. like we have in the bay. <laughs> well, yep. it, is, it is two feet over the property line and it's two and a half feet larger than previously approved. Yeah. Um, well, it's two and a half feet over the extended property line. Right. No, That's it's what, two feet over the property line, more or less. I think it's but, at, at most two feet over the property but the, line. But the entirety of it, the entirety of the structure is within Shinnecock Beach Road, which is technically our property. Right. So it's two and a half feet over the extended property lines there. And if you, you project the line down, it, it's two and a half feet over, but it's within our property. Right. So, so does it really matter that it's over the extended property line when it doesn't belong to the neighbor at all? It just belongs to the trustees. Right. That's, right. That's the question. <laughs> wow, Sean. we got good ones, don't we? <laughs> Sean. Mm. Because if it was a dock, we'd move it over. We'd right. be taken out and moved over. Well, but it's in the dead. same location where it's been since at least 1976. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very familiar with it. It's just okay. looking at I'm looking at it through a different set of eyes now, being that we've had some, you know, questions yeah. about this in the past along right. a stretch. Right. Is it something that we should have the uh, contractor cut that two and a half feet over and move it over solely on in their uh, envelope in front of their house? Or is it something that we approve and then the neighbor comes and sues us at a later time and uh, says, you know, you approved a structure that's, you know, in my riparian rights or whatever? Is, am I saying that right? Right. I agree with you. I agree with you yeah. on that. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Sean, are you there? Can you weigh in on this, maybe? Suzanne, does he does not share this with his neighbor, right? No, the neighbor is um it's her brother owns um the adjacent property and he has a similar platform um on his property on the yeah. Western side of his property. Yes. But if it's all on his property, does it go to the neighbor's property on the other side? It, it does, Billy. None of them line up very well. Oh, None of them? Well, was there, was, was there a problem years ago with the surveyors with the wrong survey lines? And now they've now they found an error and they've justified everybody's property lines. And now that's why we have the problem. Because I know that that happened in a couple of places and even in Mauritius where there was hundreds of lots involved where everything had to be shifted over because somebody was a, a well i mean i really calculation years ago i really don't feel comfortable permitting something that for the trustees the way this lays out here because it might be brother sister and best friends for but, now yep. but in the future if it's sold and i have a couple past you know issues with stuff like this and it, it always come back to haunt me Mm -hmm. No, I know. That's I, that's why I want Sean. Well, I think we better sit yeah. down. 
I'm taking uh, a look at it. Um, I'm going to advise against advancing this. Um, oh yeah, definitely, definitely. If you want to apply together and they both are property owners and can prove it to us, that's something different. Yeah, but it's on our property, Sean. It's on the Shinnecock Beach Road. That's a trustee it's road. Outside of their road? deeded property. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not crazy about that. So can I, I'm going to sit down with you and James uh, sometime later this week if you're in the office on your. Yeah, I'm in the office Wednesday through Friday right now. We'll take a look at it. Um, just look at yeah. this though. Well, let's see, let's see what's involved in even cutting it back. I mean, you know, it might yeah. be a tremendous amount of disturbance and everything to move it two feet over. Yeah, and let me look at the uh, little minutes of the last meeting when we approved the other permit that's there, the structure that's there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can get a little bit back history on it. We need to pull everything. Yes. Um, so so I, I'd say you hold this till the next work session. Yep. I'm going to hold yep. it to the next work session uh, when yep. I can get There's some no work done. There's no yep. rush. No rush. All right, Susanna. Okay. Let me yeah. know if you need any additional information or anything. I okay. will be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you. Susanna, we need you for the next one. Too. Yeah, I'm here for the next one too. <clears throat> Middle bomb. This is another one uh, on Middle Pond. The bulkhead was put in, in like in the 70s here. Um, it's in terrible disrepair. So, uh, Susanna, you want to uh, uh, speak to the raising of the one foot of, on the elevation of the bulkhead? I know one of the properties is a little bit higher than this. Yeah, the neighbor, um, I don't know which photos I submitted, whether it shows it very well. Um, I can share my screen or if, or if James is that you, James? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, can you? Uh oh, it's upside down. Yeah, sorry, I had to change. You it. see the northerly property? It's <laughs> elevated. See if we got a better one here. This one here. Yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to see in the distance there. But but it I is elevated. Measure. Yeah, I would, it, and I measured it. It's a good foot higher. Is that yeah. it right here? Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, that's. Yeah, there, that's a good one at the bottom there. Something, yeah. you know, um, it would reduce the runoff that goes into the bay in this area. And it would be consistent with the neighbor, the highest adjoining property, which would be the northerly one. So I'd like to match it up so they're the same height. Right. So I, and I guess a foot would accomplish that. It would. The, um, the survey that I submitted with the application actually has spot elevations along the bulkhead. So you can compare. Um, yeah, the top of the bulkhead adjacent is 3.9 and the top of the bulkhead here is 2.9. So a foot would be appropriate then. Right, right. And I think it's being overtopped in your bigger storms. Um, this damage that you see in the middle of the bulkhead, that happened all at once. Um, it was pretty, um, pretty disturbing for my client to be out here to, to see that happening to um, to his property. So is he going to need any reclamation dredging? Because I know there's a pretty, it's pretty deep in front of that bulkhead or oh, it was pretty deep in front of that bulkhead. I don't think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, James, it's, it's all compliant with what we need, correct? Yeah, they got a buffer uh, beach grass behind it, um, non-treated lumber and stuff like that. So, and we'd yeah. like to get this approved as quickly as possible. He's yeah, very, I mean, very nervous about I, it. I don't see anything. Yeah, I know. The longer we wait, the more the bulkhead's going to fall in. So, right. I, I don't see anything that for reason for us to hold it back. So, I like to move it ahead. Yeah, I'm okay with it. I'm okay yeah. with it. Thank Fine. You. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. <clears throat> Okay. So Bill's next with Noah Lessa. 1770 North Sea Road is um, into science here. Yep. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you. Now we can see you. 
We could see your head, the top of your head. Hold on a second. How's that? Better? That's good. So, Bill, do you want me to take the lead on this? Or do you... Take the lead. Tell us all about it. Okay. So, not too long ago, I was before you to talk about this project for a bulkhead and dock replacement. The board had some concerns about the replacement of the dock because there's been some shoaling of the creek from siltation buildup um, over time since that dock was originally permitted by the trustees and installed. So we um, removed the dock from the application because there was immediacy to get the permits to do the bulkhead repair. Um, this was the emergency one that you had? Yeah, yeah, but the problem we've come in, what we've come up against is the DEC and the Army Corps have just been dragging their feet. It's been impossible to get the Army Corps to give us any indication as to when we can expect the permit. Um, we finally got the DEC to give us indications that the bulkhead is actually um, something that they would permit us to do. Um, but they had some questions about our portion, the, the dock portion of the application, um, which we were able to resolve. And now we're coming back to you while we're waiting for the Army Corps to come back to us. We're coming back to you to resolve the dock portion of this. Um, so the um, bulkhead all stays the same as a permitted. We're not doing any changes to that. We're going to keep that permit intact. So we're asking you for a new permit to replace the floating dock, which was it exists legally pursuant to a permit that was issued by the trustees in 1982. Um, we're, well, we're looking to replace it with a fixed pier catwalk to um, a platform. Um, it's a six by eight platform. Second. Everything will be constructed of uh, through flow material um, as normal. And um, this has been designed to meet the DEC comments. So we feel as though it's a good first application to the trustees because it's been vetted by um, already by the DEC and it's something that the trustees are familiar with permitting for alternatives to floating docks. So while it's not optimal to my client, he's conceded to the fact that this is what the trustees are going to, I'm sorry, the DEC is going to approve. And it's something that would probably appear um, address the original trustees concerns about the shallow water depths due to the shoaling of this creek. Yeah. Um, the only, uh, only alternative that we would have would be to um, take on a full large scope dredging project to look at cleaning out the siltation deposits that have um, encumbered this creek over the last few decades. Um, I think that's something that the trustees probably will want to be starting to look at at, at some point in the near future, um, because this is a very valuable alewife migration uh, yeah. location, but we're not looking at opening up that box right now. Um, we're trying to take the path of least resistance here and get some kind of docking for um, kayaks, canoes, you know, and very small dinghies at this site. So this application is to construct a four foot by 10 foot fixed walkway extending to a six by eight platform um, to replace the floating dock. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Well, that is a floating dock you have there. No, that's the, that's the old dock to be removed. Uh, that's, that's the one that was permitted and that's the one yeah. that exists. Yeah, this but, would be consistent on what we had permitted in other areas. Have yeah, a dock right. with a step down so uh, you can yep. get onto a kayak or a yep. canoe. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. The only question I got is, um, why do you need the other platform if you if you have this platform? Um, the other platform is was historically it's again it's existed there for a long time it's historically been used as a swim platform which will now be even more important since they are losing the ability to have the floating dock out into deeper waters yeah but 
That's two docks on one property. Wow, yeah. Yeah. That's not what something our regulations would permit, correct? Right. Yes. You're right. They, they, I understand that, um, but they've existed for quite a long time, according to the owner, and um, they'd like to be able to um, maintain them. Do they have a permit for that one there? Is it all legal? Um, the, it is, you know. The trustee file is a little bit tricky on this property. There um, is a lot of language associated with dredging, bulkhead replacements, um, the construction of the dock in the past, um, but nothing specifically to say for fact that that was neither permitted or if it was permitted, there's it, it, just no indication. I, I, can't, I can't tell you yes or no. It's been on a couple of the surveys. Oh, but it's permitting legally. We, we sh it would be two docks on one property, right? Right. I mean, that's what. I, and then I know, and historically, since I've been on the board, one of them would go away, and we would, you know, permit the other one. I mean, right. there's, there's there's like no water where that dock platform is. It would open the door for uh, a lot of problems. Yes, we're, not, we're consistent with our regulations, and that would open up. Uh, and we've been very consistent with uh, only one dock per lot. And, and, and the one, and it's it's a highly restrained area for depth, width, and it's a extremely productive LY run, probably the biggest in the uh, state of New York. So you know we have to be very careful for the ecology of the whole area too. Mm -hmm. I know it's pre it's existed for decades, but. Also, what about the, um, it shows on the plans, but I can't see it on the uh, aerial that uh, there's a canoe rack or s series of um, projections that are at a canoe rack. Yes. They're coming off. They, they, they're proposed to be replaced. Um, replaced? Yeah, again, they're part of the history of the property, and yeah. I don't have an indication as to how they got there in terms of permitting, um, but the client is, the, the owner is very attached to these structures. Um, I guess they have had some value to them over the years in terms of usability. Um, I would ask the board to take into consideration the fact that they do have a longevity associated with them. I recognize your position that it may be unorthodox for you to permit two structures um, hanging off a bulkhead like this, um, but you do give certain um, exceptions for certain certain circumstances, and this is one where the client has a history that he he's able to verbally tell me about, but we can't document um, exactly how they got there. So- Well, what do these uh, racks look like? They're yeah. just basically like two by sixes or four by sixes that extend off the bulkhead. They're, everything's very dilapidated. As I told you before, the bulkhead is failing. Um, yeah, you can see that's the platform down there. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then down past that, you can barely see them, but they're just, they're just cantilevered out like two by fours that are cantilevered out. Well, I don't think there was, I don't think they've been there for over 10 years. Yeah, but that, Billy, that's something we would permit normally yeah, on, I would on a bulkhead. Yeah, it's not a dock. But, but the dock, the dock bulk. is, the dock could, the dock is going to be problematic. Two docks. I agree with you. Yeah, it's going to be problematic for the entire town. Yeah, especially um, up a couple of properties north, at which um, they might be coming in to change the zoning on. You know, that'll serve the, the, the dock that he's talking about, the platform that he's talking about will serve the purpose of yeah. the other. There's going to be too many problems throughout the town. I mean, this, uh, we allowed this, there'd be people jumping on, on the bandwagon all over the place. Okay. So pretty, pretty clearly in the, in the rules and regulations, one dock per lot. All right. I, again, I'm not here to, to demand it. Um, I understand. The, the, the property owner was, 
hopeful that the board would understand his position, but I did explain this situation to him. Um, you know, I, I understand the board's um, position on these matters and um, I told him all we could do is, is try and, um, and you gave it a good try. Explain our yeah. situation, and, and that's what we're doing. So yeah. I, I, I appreciate the board giving a consideration, um, and I would like them to advance. I would like you guys to advance this. So I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to advise the client that you know it's probably best for us is to concede and and um, move on. Well, I think you're going to have to have to explain to him that uh, it's it's not him. It's a consistent policy throughout the town and. Uh, deviating from that consistent policy would cause a, a ripple effect through the town. Okay. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. And that's okay. what I've explained to him in the past. And that's where I'm okay. going to go back to. Okay. Great. Okay. Appreciate your time, Brant. So you're going to resubmit this, Brant? So, yes. Um, it looks like we'll have to give you a revised narrative um, okay. and, and revised plans to show that those will be removed. Okay. Um, Thank you. So, my guess is, will you be able to advance this without those materials? Um, uh, no, we need that the paperwork so we can advance it. Okay. Um, we can, we can, uh, we can or, or could you just can, advance? Could I you can advance, advance and just have the paperwork um, brought into us? Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to be can, uh, two weeks before it, it's yeah. been decided. Right. So if he gets the paperwork in with the revised plans, consistent with what we just had asked him, I don't see any reason yeah. why. No. Yeah, I mean, we can work on that right away. So it's just a matter of getting this stuff off to the property owner and getting him to, to um, agree and we'll get the, we'll get it back to you. If for some reason he doesn't agree, then when you come to um, to make a formal decision on this, I'll bring that to your attention and you can right. um, we can abandon the. Okay. So okay. I like All to right. I like to advance this and um, without that one deck. To be removed, we moved off the plan. Okay. No, that's, good. that's that's all you're changing, right? It's just taking that one existing uh, deck to be removed by. Yeah, and is it also is there a ladder on this? I did not yeah, notice there the ladder. There's a ladder, right? There's a ladder. Okay. Yeah, there's a ladder. There's a ladder on the proposed platform. Yes. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Hi, Brent. Have a good night. Take care. Good evening. Is anyone here for the next one? Jeffrey Payne. Land use, I believe. You have anyone waiting in the room, Charlie? Charles? No one's here. All right, then I'd like to hold this one off to the next one. I want to go back down and walk down the property. I just thought of something when I was looking at the pictures I, I missed. Okay. I'm okay. double check. So you're going to hold that? I want to yeah. hold this one. Okay. So I have, I have 117 Cobile Road, LLC, 117 Cobile. Um, we discussed this at the last work session and Sean, if you're on here, when you um, pulled up the, um, the uh, site, it showed that there was a flag on the property. Yes. That has since been removed from what I see, but if you wanna check that, because we held it, we held it pending the removal of the flag. And this was a flag that had to do with construction on the house and that there were um, too many people oh. um, as, as uh, determined by the COVID. COVID uh, the uh, flag has been removed from GIA. Okay. Okay. So can we move this forward then, Sean? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, great. I'd like to advance this, please, then. 117 Cabal Road. Thank you, Sean. You're welcome.
Okay. Okay. All right. So that concludes the uh, the permits. Anybody have any uh, anything to bring up today? Uh, I believe Mr. Malcolmson's going to start his project on the twenty fifth of uh, January at okay. Far Pond Road. So if anybody's in the neighborhood, they should uh, ride down there and see how it's uh, progressing. I know I will be down there on a regular basis. Have you had discussions with him about uh, what we were talking about with who was going to move the sand? I need to get some information from the office and furnish okay. it to him. And then once that happens, then I'll, uh, I'll discuss it with the board. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Bill, you got anything? I'm good. Uh, Ann? Just Meacox and SAG are both open. SAG opened itself over the weekend with the big storm surf. And you could see on Tom Wilson's graphs that when Meacox overwashed, you could see the salinity spikes mm -hmm. in Meacox, which is super interesting. Mm -hmm. But that's it for now. Yeah, that's some really good information. Yes, we really discuss what's happened. Mm -hmm. Those are questions I'm going to have for many years. Now they're going to get yep. answered. Yeah, right. And maybe uh, maybe some student will come up with a computer model and uh, put us out of business about determining when to open it, right? <laughs> <laughs> More power to them, Eric. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll close the meeting and uh, we'll see you on Monday, 1 o'clock. Right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Right. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Have a good evening. James, Thanks. Charles, take care.